Hey everybody, welcome to the composting class. We'll uh we'll let folks get on. I see people rolling in, rolling in. Welcome, welcome. Give people a second to roll in. Good morning. I just realized tomorrow's Mother's Day, Ross. Yes, it is. <laughs> happy <laughs> Mother's it. Day. Your mother, happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. Quarantine Mother's Day. <laughs> yep. Now I don't have to worry about waiting in them long breakfast line. Get them kids up and have them make breakfast. <laughs> right. Well, that's every day for me. We have a whole routine. Somebody okay. makes breakfast, somebody makes dinner. Yeah, they got to learn in this quarantine life. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hey guys, I uh, just give a, people a couple minutes to join. Um, hey Terry, hey Barbara, I see you in the chat box already. Appreciate that. Good morning to you and happy Mother's Day. Tomorrow's Mother's Day. Everything is going so fast. I was like, oh, tomorrow's Mother's Day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I, um, um, if you, good morning, Zora. Um, if you're on the line and, and you're new to Zoom, I'd like you to find the chat box. We'll be using that to communicate with each other. Hey, Sharon, happy Mother's Day. Um, she said, Sharon said, thank you for this class, Ross. Um, well, definitely. Yeah. Um, Michelle, quick question. Yes. Should you cover the fruit tree in this weather? That's a good, that's a good question. Definitely. Um, it, 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 I wonder if it's budding yet. Um, my blueberry is blood budding, so you may want to. If it's budding, you may want to protect those buds because if they if they freeze, then you won't get any fruit. Um, <clears throat> hello everyone. Okay, looks like a lot of people are on. We got about sixty folks on already. Um, I if you if you're new to Zoom, there's a you should see a button called the chat box will be in there make sure you open that up we'll be in there having our questions and dialogue in there um and if you can if you found the chat box do me a favor and just drop a line and tell me how you doing today how are you doing just say i'm doing good i'm gonna tell you i'm i am great today i feel good nicole fox meh come on get it together energized What's going on, Nicole? I'm gonna have to holler at you later. Uh, Tom, you're doing good, good. Thumbs up from Michelle, doing great, Joe says. Kevin's doing good, excited. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I know, I wish the sun would come back to us. Hopefully next week will be better. Um, Caitlin's feeling productive this morning, good. Okay, looks like folks found the chat box. That's good. Looking forward to learning. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I want to, just to get us through the slides, feeling excited and a great. Um, just to get through the slides, I wanna make sure, let's um, let's throw your questions about the, the composting content in the chat box. If you have questions about, you know, other other gardening, issues that you're having, or if you have questions about the garden resource program or Keep Growing Detroit or resources, let's save those to the end. I'll stick around for a couple minutes after the webinar is done, but I don't wanna get the chat box all confused with, um, with, all, with a lot of different questions. Let's just go with the questions about the content in the, in the chat box. Um, I, uh, if, you, um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is T. I work at Keep Growing Detroit. Um, Keep Growing Detroit is, uh, we operate an urban farm in the city, and we also operate one of the oldest programs in the city called the Garden Resource Program, which provides seeds and plants um, and all kind of gardening supplies and education for gardeners across the city. Uh, we're really excited because we just hit 1,550 gardens that signed up, Ross. <laughs> it's awesome because... Um, that's pretty much a high point for this point in the season. We're not, we're not usually there. Um, we're not usually that high in the season. So we're anticipating, you know, growing to about 17 to 1800 gardens this, uh, this, uh, this season with, um, 
within pandemic. Yeah, that is really awesome, Shaki. I'm yeah. excited about that. So, um, so I want to go ahead and kick it off. I thought that um, me and Ross were talking yesterday, and um, this is oh, let me introduce you. <laughs> this is uh, this is my friend Ross here. He is um, an urban farmer, uh, a couple generations in. Um, he's also a community activist, so he works uh, nine to five at Moses, but then also has a, a nonprofit that he runs, which is a housing uh, nonprofit, and um, they're working on um, getting getting folks um, housing and getting their taxes and everything right. And a part of that that he's working on is this sustainable uh, sustainable housing project. So um, he's uh, developing. Um, uh, housing that uh, has farms and gardens attached to them, right, Ross, or something like that. It's a really cool project. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. So, um, wanted to bring him on as a um, wanted to bring him on as a guest. Uh, Dajanaba, nope, I don't hear you. <laughs> I don't hear your children running around. This is uh, just so you guys know. This is a webinar. We can't see you. You can see us. Um, we can hear you only through the chat box. Um, toward the end, as we get into just regular gardening questions, um, uh, I can probably unmute some folks and we can just talk a little bit off topic. Um, Ross, where can they learn more about your housing program? A couple of people asked. Um, if you actually uh, put my email uh, in the chat and I'll, um, if you guys can send me an email and then I'll send you information about our housing program. So I'm going to do that you. now you guys <laughs> all right so it looks like we have a majority of people on the line now i'm going to kick us off with a with a poll uh samantha said thanks for that information um i'm going to start us off with a poll just to see who all is in the room okay uh let me launch that can you guys see that let's see can you see the poll ross uh can i see the poll give me one I don't know I if do you can participate as a panelist, but nope, I see it. Okay, great, great. Jump on in there. I'd like to know what type of garden do you have? Is it a family garden, a community garden, a school garden, a market garden, or you're still working on that? You don't have your garden yet. You're trying to figure that out. Um, when you sign up for the garden resource program, we ask you, um, we ask you this question: Are you a family garden or a community garden, a school garden or a market garden? And then we. Um, we send you different reminders based on what kind of garden you have. So I just wanted to know who was in the room so we can see like what size you're working with kind of. Um, and then second question, do you currently compost? Um, not yet, I'm here to learn. Uh, yeah, I have a small pile or yes, I manage a large pile or there are some programs where people are sending food scraps to community gardens. Uh, if, that is, if that is the bucket you're in, let us know. Um, why is compost important to you? Um, compost is important for a number of reasons. I just want to see, you know, what, what you guys are thinking and why you joined up for this class. I'm going to end the poll in a couple seconds. So jump in with your votes. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to jump in. Michelle says she's, she's composting, but she's sure she's making some mistakes. So she's ready to learn. I hear you. Um, yeah, I'm part of learning them. Mistakes. <laughs> Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results with you, Ross, so we can see okay. who all is in the room. Let's see what we got here. All right. So most, looks yeah, like half family. the people are family gardens. Okay. Oh, no, more than half. <laughs> yeah, 73%. So that would mean they're probably in their backyard composting. Mm -hmm. um, and half of us have, half of us have a pile and half of us are just here to learn. So you got a mixed crowd. Um, and then of all of these reasons, most people are, are well aware mm -hmm. that composting is both good for the planet, it's removing waste from the landfill, and it's good for your plants. Good. So you're, you're here for all the information. Um, Kathy, Ross put his uh, email. Did you put your email in the? Yeah, I put my email in there in the chat. Okay. If you scroll up in the chat, you should see his email, and he can shoot you some information about the housing program that he is. That's... Um, Community, what say it again? I don't want to mess Center up the name. Center for Community Justice and Advocacy. Thank you. <laughs> it's a long one, or CCJA is the acronym that we use. Center for Community Justice, justice and yeah. Advocacy. Yes. All right. 
Okay, um, before we get going, I thought we would um, start with a small video, just it's about five minutes, but it really sets a context for the larger picture. We know that um, industrial agriculture is, uh, while it's providing a lot of food for people, right, it's also, it's, it's also um, has, its, has its concerns because it's doing a little bit of destruction on the planet. So this is some of the reason why we're, we're trying to shift into more people growing food locally. Um, and I just wanted to share this video that me and Ross were looking at yesterday as we were planning for the class. Um, all right, hopefully, hopefully you guys can see that. You see that, Ross? Yes, I do. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and play it. This is like a five minute video, so it's really cute. Our soil is dying. We tend to focus on issues such as fossil fuels or water in our fight for climate action, and often the issue of soil quality gets left in the dust. But it takes an average of 500 years to naturally build an inch of topsoil, and we're losing it at 17 times that rate. Although soil degradation can be caused by a number of natural factors, increasingly soil quality is affected by human actions. Today I'm going to narrow in on one of the bigger human-caused factors, industrial agriculture, in order to answer what soil degradation is, why it's happening, and why we need to strive for better soil health. So first, what is soil degradation? Quite simply, it means a decline in soil health as a result of misuse or poor management. Soil can vary widely in its depth depending on whether it's young or stable and old, but it's generally teeming with life. According to the Earth Institute at Columbia University, it's estimated that an acre of soil may contain 900 pounds of earthworms, 2,400 pounds of fungi, 1,500 pounds of bacteria, 133 pounds of protozoa, 890 pounds of arthropods and algae, and even sometimes small mammals. And when soil health is affected, this biodiverse system wanes. Why then is soil degradation such a big issue now? While the quality of topsoil can definitely be damaged by natural occurrences like floods or wind, the rate of topsoil loss has increased radically over the last 200 years in the United States as a result of modern agricultural practices. In Pimentel et al.'s study on the economics of soil erosion and conservation, they estimate that in the United States, soil has been lost at about 17 times the rate at which it's formed. We can pin some of the soil loss to the intensive cultivation practices and monocropping of industrial agriculture. When we till and turn over a field for the next season's crop using large combines, the topsoil is decimated, much in the same way habitat is lost when clear-cutting a forest. Tillage aerates the soil by breaking up its composition, but in the process compacts the soil underneath and kills the wealth of microorganisms hidden to the naked eye. As a result of many years of industrial cultivation practices, the topsoil lies void of life and then needs to be injected with nutrient-filled fertilizer and chemicals, which in turn alter the chemical makeup of the soil and make it even harder for essential organisms to survive. In short, cultivating the soil always results in the decline of its fertility and health. And the continual use of intensive cultivation over the last century has left the United States with a looming soil crisis. So why does degraded topsoil even matter? And will it even affect me? Yes, it will. And even more than you think. Healthy soil is the foundation for healthy plants, which are obviously crucial for our survival. This means that when we continually abuse soil structure and quality to pump out massive amounts of corn and soybeans, we are making it harder to grow nutrient-dense food in the future. Right now, almost 33% of the world's soil has been moderately or highly degraded according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And when you consider that soil can store almost three times more carbon than forests and other vegetation, 
killing it could lead to our inability to mitigate climate change. In order to halt this process, we need to reconsider the way we approach agriculture. In Pimentel's study, they argue that the total investment for U.S. erosion control would be about $8.4 billion per year. Considering that erosion causes $44 billion in damages each year, and could very well cause more, this is a no-brainer. But on a more basic level, we should look towards the examples of innovators like Curtis Stone, who was able to create a comfortable lifestyle on a low-till intensive urban farm. His farm builds soil health by adding compost and natural fertilizer like turkey manure to the soil, as well as keeping the cultivation of the land to a minimum. Yes, industrial agricultural practices have provided a large amount of food to North America, but when we consider the long-term negative effects of those practices and the fact that our food system now relies heavily on just a few crops, the positives of supposed abundance merely seem like a flimsy patch for a leaking ship. Soil is our hidden lifeline, and if we destroy it, we lose our ability to feed ourselves and protect our environment. Okay, folks, not to be a downer. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Um, anybody want to jump in the chat box and tell me what they thought about that before we get started? Um, if not, we can move right on into the presentation. Uh, when you, you know, when you um, think about the fact that our planet um, is three fourths water and one fourth land, right? And then one fourth of the land, I mean, the land that we have, um, probably half of it is like mountains and non arable soil, like stuff we can't farm. Um, we, you know, we, we need to be aware of like how we're using our soil and um, how we're depleting our soil. And composting is really exciting to me because um, it's returning nutrients back to the soil. Um, it's the natural flow that we need to be in. And that's why, um, that's why I'm excited to bring this topic today. Um, and you guys, um, folks who are gardening are at the front lines of this work. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. You ready, Ross? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up this PowerPoint. And um, all right, um, Brenda says, should we stop tilling our gardens? You know, uh, we do advocate for low till. You know, um, you know, if you if you've tilled if you've tilled it to open up the ground, um, and then you do uh, things that you can um, like putting it to bed at the end of the season and uh, and things like that. You shouldn't have to till every year. So we can talk a little bit. Um, little bit about that toward the end some more. Again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat box. Um, Ross, we can go ahead and get started. I'm on, uh, let's see if I can control these slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Where do we go? Oh, there you uh, good. <laughs> so why, uh, let me start it. While you get that figure out, um, I'll just go on a little bit of background what got me into gardening. Um, so what brought me into into gardening into farming was actually my father um he when i actually when uh, i was born he was 70 years old so he actually lived through the great depression um and he will always tell me um how to take care of yourself and not only how to take care of yourself but how to how to provide for yourself when you can't depend on you know so grocery stores or government because they didn't have food stamps at that time. They didn't have um, stimulus checks. So during the Great Depression, a lot of the communities that survived or did that did okay were actually gardening. So um, that's how that's who really got me into the composting, to gardening, and so forth was basic survival. And I think right now what we're seeing is we're seeing a kind of return to small gardens, and we and we should see a return to small gardens because right now if you look. Uh, the grocery stores are, I don't know when the last time a lot of you've been to the grocery stores, but the shelves are looking a little bit bleak. They don't look as full as they used to. And now they're talking about food shortage. So right now is definitely a time to get into it. Um, so we can go ahead and get into the composting basics. Let's see. Go to the next slide. 
blow up my screen a little bit because I'm on my phone, okay? Uh, so composting is one of the best additions to our garden and it's, it's important to live with living soil because in the compost, there's living things in there. So when you look at the food scraps and you look at broken eggshells and, and um, decaying grass, those are things that are still living. Um, it's gonna help you also maintain a lot of your yard waste. So, you know, a lot of us, or sometimes you see people putting their grass clippings on the curb or leaves. Those are things that you can actually put into your compost, okay? So those are things that you can put back into the ground and it's gonna give your vegetables and, and your flowers all the nutri that nutrition that's needed. So instead of going to Home Depot and these gardening centers, buying big bags of soil, and I, I think y'all remember a couple of weeks ago, they did a stay at home order where the, the garden was considered non-essential. And I actually went to the garden just to see, or went to Home Depot to see if that was true. And you can buy soil, you can buy seeds, you can buy starter plants. So having your own compost is definitely, definitely great to you know, sustain yourself. And then it also limits the amount of greenhouse, greenhouse gases that are produced. So it keeps a lot of that food waste out of the landfill. Um, one thing I think that a lot of us should do is try to compost and recycle and find out how much trash that you actually throw away. It's actually a very small amount that you actually throw away if you recycle and compost, okay? I'm gonna go to the next slide. So what is compost, okay? Um, compost, does everybody remember, um, and I'm, I'm gonna quote this movie because one of my favorite movies of all time is Lion King, the circle of life, right? So composting is literally a circle of life, okay? It's the way, of nat it's the way that nature recycles. Um, another thing that we say from ashes, uh, from, from what's it? ash to ash, dust to dust, when we, our bodies return back to the soil, it's returning those, those things that the earth produces, leaves, green leaves, brown leaves, food, um, water, um, all those things return back into the soil. And the way that they do that is they break down from water, air, and microorganisms. So um, you ever flip over a log that's been sitting on the ground for a while, and you see at the bottom of it, it's kind of looking more dirt, it's kind of breaking down. Uh, you see those, those worms, they're breaking that down, okay? And if you leave it there long enough, it'll actually be dark, dark, black, rich, okay? And it smells very earthy. Um, that's compost, okay? Um, it's very different than topsoil. Um, topsoil is more sandy, um, clayish. So even when they tear down a lot of these houses and you see them put that, that dirt on top, that is topsoil. Or you see somebody wants to level out the ground, um, that's topsoil, okay? Um, you, some soil, some topsoil does have organic matter in it, but most uh, the things you want to grow in is going to be compost. It's going to be that dark, rich uh, dirt. Okay. Go ahead and go to the next one. Actually, let's stay on this one for a minute. I'm sorry. Um, so, if you look at the slide, you have brown. Let me zoom in for myself. So you have brown plus green equals compost. And then certain added um, external factors is what really gets that compost moving. Okay, so the brown would be like your, your leaves in the fall, um, straw. Um, I do a lot of wood splitting, so I put a lot of my uh, wood scraps that are left over from uh, me splitting wood in there. Um, I have chicken, so I use a lot of the straw uh, in there. And then when I cut the grass, that would be my greens. So I would put some of that in there. And then also the food scraps. So, you know, um, your, your lettuce heads that you don't eat, um, you know, the piece of broccoli, all those things um, that are organic produce, not organic pro produce, is what we put together. And then you put that in a compost bin. And when you get air in there with water and bacteria, fungus, um, that's what starts to really heat that compost up. And that's where you get the compost material from. Okay. Go to the next slide, T. Oh, so, yep, this is what we were talking about. So, the browns. Uh, browns are the plant-based material that are high in carbon. So, it's mostly dead. 
Um, like I said, it'd be like wood chips left out, um, leaves, straw, um, things of that nature. And if you ever notice, they don't really have a smell to it. Um, unless they, unless the leaves get really wet, but more than likely they don't have a smell. They're going to be dry. Okay. Go to the next slide. I want greens. And the greens, yep. The greens would be, like I said, gr grass clippings, uh, coffee grounds, uh, weeds without seeds. Um, I learned that one the hard way. <laughs> um, I what actually happened? put some weeds in my compost, and next thing I know, I had weeds growing in the compost. <laughs> so uh, definitely put the weeds in without seeding, uh, bolted lettuce. Um, so what I did last year is after you use uh, shipment boxes for browns. Um, I've used paper bags um, and newspaper, not like the glossy newspaper, but just a uh, regular newspaper to get some of that, that, um, that brown paper. Uh, brewery waste, so like hops, uh, grains from breweries, um, orange peels, uh, spoiled food. I just actually took some food out of my refrigerator today, and I'm going to show you guys uh, that as well. Eggshells. Um, and then another thing about the coffee grounds, um, actually Starbucks, you can go to a lot of coffee places, and they will actually give you their coffee grounds for free. So that's some good information for you as well. And that gives you uh, high uh, nit nitrogen. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. I was just looking at some of these questions in the chat box real quick while you're, um, but the, um, uh, so yeah, so um, can you plant directly into the compost, um, which is a good question. Um, some folks, some folks do, question. and some, some folks mix it. Uh, we definitely recommend mixing it with the topsoil mix, um, only because um, it's a lot of nutrients that your plants are getting. You know, that being said, if you know, you can definitely um, also just grow right in there. So it's kind of a matter of preference. What do you think about that? Um, I have never grown, grown directly into my compost. Um, just because I like to give it time to to really break down. Um, just because I know I put like a lot of wood chips in there and I put a lot of uh, food scraps. So I like to let it break down before I do that. Um, but I, like you said, I have heard of people doing it and I think it's just a, a preference. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, do you put citrus in your piles? I do just a little bit. Okay. It's just, just a little bit. And I don't put too many onion, onion peels in my, uh, compost. And, uh, I saw somebody ask about the acidity of putting too much coffee grounds in there. And that can do that. If you put too much, um, too much coffee grounds or too much like onion peels make it to a city. I know some of these are going to get answered as we go, so I'll keep keep it moving here. Okay. Air, 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 air. Um, we all need air. Air keeps everything moving, and just like uh, that, you need air in your compost. Um, they're going to be the workhorse of the compost, and they require, uh, the microbes require air to, to thrive. Um, if a pile is too wet, uh, without air, it's going to cause the pile to um, be, it's going to really stink. It's going to be really mushy. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to be something that you really want around. And it's also going to slow the, the, the decomposition uh, process. De um, so a way that, that I do um, make sure I have air is sometimes I open up my compost bin from time to time. And then I also incorporate um, a lot of the sticks, twigs, really small sticks and twigs um, to make sure that there's space for air to flow through um, the compost. And so it's not too compacted. Um, learning, I learned that, you know, I, I didn't put sticks in there at one point in time and I just tried to fill it up with a whole bunch of food scraps, a whole bunch of dead wet leaves and put water on it and it was taking forever to really break down. But after I put those sticks in there and I got it moving around with air, it speeded it up a lot. Mm, that's a good tip. And here's another one, the water. So um, once again, a learning, a learning experience when I first started. <laughs> um, not put, I was wondering, looking at my compost, like, okay, I got this dry stuff in here. I have these food scraps. 
why is this not breaking down? And then I also stuck my head in there. I'm like, you know, people said that there was supposed to be some type of, of steam or something, it would be hot in here, and it wasn't. Uh, the, the compost was too dry. So um, a lack of water is often the factor limiting the development of that heat. And that heat is also needed to really warm up the microbes and um, really start to get that, that activation going. If you don't, all those things are gonna be dormant. So even if you go in there without water, say you just look at your compost and it's super dry, you won't even really notice a lot of insects or a lot of worms really. Um, it, you need that water to really get that, that, that steam going. Go to the next one. So life, the natural um, occurring microbes and bacteria. So these are gonna be, if you see that little picture, those are gonna be like your, your centipedes, your earthworms, um, all type of bacteria, all type of little other bugs that I'm not really familiar with names are, but you definitely, if you look in there and you see bugs crawling, then it's good. Like I said, if you ever pick up a log and look at the bottom of that log and you see a whole bunch of bugs moving around and you look at the bottom of it and see how much that, that, log, that log is starting to break down and starting to turn into like a dark, dark color, that's that bacteria and that's the actual natural life um, turning all those things back into dirt. Okay. Mm-hmm. And these are the things that you do not want to add to the compost. So, like I said, the weeds with seeds, uh, learn from experience on that, and they will start to grow in there. Um, also, animal products. So, like cheese, um, milk, uh, you don't really want to add that in there. Uh, meat, you don't want to add those in there. Bones, uh, oil. Um, so even like if you cook vegetables, I, what I try to do is if I cook vegetables in like a oil or a butter, I usually I won't, won't add that to my compost just to be on the safe side. Um, T, can you add like vegetable scraps that have been cooked in butter? I try not to. Um, I think most people try not to, yeah. The oil is hard. Okay. Yeah. So um, those are things that I don't add, and these are things that you don't want to add to your compost. Uh, people are asking, okay, like, what happens building? if you add those, thi add those things? Um, uh, certain things are just really hard for those microbes to break down. So um, like oranges, like orange peels and um, lemon peels, those citrus things, we don't naturally, Michigan is not, um, we don't naturally um, grow oranges and, and, you know, unless we're in a greenhouse or something like that. They don't grow here. So the microbes here have a harder time breaking it down. Um, also, if you think about like the, the bones and the oils, um, they're harder to break down, but they also attract more rodents as well. So there was a couple of questions in there about that. So I just wanted to mention that. Sorry, uh, Ross. No, you're good, because I was just, um, if you want to answer any more questions, I saw another one pop up real quick. I, yeah. Uh, what happens I if you put old part. food in your compost, like if you made like some soup that went bad? Um, I mean, it depends soup. on what's in the soup, though, I, w I would believe. Yeah. If it was like a, if it was like a meat-based soup, it's not that it won't break down, but it's going to also attract more rodents to your pile. Um, Horse and cow manure are good. You can put those in there. Yeah. You, do you do bananas? Banana peels? I, do, I put banana peels in mine, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Do you add chicken droppings? Um, yes. Yeah, so I have, I just got some chickens recently. Um, so I did add their bedding to my compost. This is the first time I've done it. So I'll see how that works out. Um, eggshells. So I've been told two different things about eggshells, and I've noted that if you put eggshells in their hole, um, like kind of like um, not really breaking them down, um, the worms will get cut by the eggshells. So it will kind of limit the amount of worms that you have in your compost. But a way around that is if you just crush them up, if you can, 
um, before you put them in the compost, it, it'll work better. It won't, the worms won't get as like cut up, but the eggshells are pretty sharp for worms. But I still put eggshells in my compost. I just try to make sure I like crush them up before I, I put them in there. Nice. Are you still on this slide? Sorry, building a compost pile. I uh, yes. So building a compost pile, um, where to site your compost. Um, you you want to do it out of the way of um, neighbors that might get upset about it not being aesthetically pleasing to the eye, or um, it might uh, might have a smell or something like that. So you want it to be considerate of your neighbors. Um, the compost pile that I have is like a kind of like a little doghouse, and it goes down about four feet. So if you were to come to my backyard, you wouldn't even know I had a compost uh, pile, just because um, I'm, I'm trying to be a little. I'm trying to be considerate of my neighbors, and also we have rodents. I was trying to keep that out of this out of the equation. Rodents getting into it, um, and then the the pile should be built up to the size of a washing machine to get it active. Um, Let's see. And then another thing is consider having space to store some of your greens and browns until you're ready to actually add them to your pile. Um, a three bin system uh, made out of pilot pallets is a good idea. So I know um, keep growing um, Detroit, you guys have like a three bin system. I, I think last time I was there, there was like a brown section, there was a green and then uh, um, food kind of a food scrap area as well. Okay, and then also uh, drainage. So just trying to keep it out of the way of like high traffic areas, I would say. Mm -hmm. I have uh, the plans for the three bin system. Um, I can send those out. Let me make a note to send those out along. And a lot of people are asking about the slideshow. I'll definitely send out the slideshow and a recording and um, whatever documents that we talk about. So don't worry about that. Um, okay, I just saw a question right. about rotating. Oh yeah, different. Um, a lot of people are asking about the different setups. So I know you're going to get into that shortly here. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. So this is the recipe. This is how, if you see that little picture, that little image, it kind of breaks down. It kind of looks like kind of like a lasagna. Um, and this is how, how, how we make it happen. Um, so you have green, the uh, browns and greens. So you have enough to build a pile of three foot by three foot by three foot or like I said, approximately the size of a washing machine. And the basic recipe, and I don't follow this recipe all the time, I just <laughs> used to throwing stuff in there, but the basic recipe is three parts brown, one part green by volume. So what that usually is, is about like three buckets of straw and one bucket of uh, food scraps. So a good way of how I've kind of done that is I have a five gallon bucket that I got from Home Depot and I set that on my back porch and I put all my food scraps in there. So I just wait for that to get f filled up and then I add that to my compost. And then I have another bucket in the backyard for like my grass clippings, um, my wood chips, and then I, I add that as well. Um, do you, have, then, do like, you ever have problems with the bucket on the backyard with, um, with like fruit flies, gnats, and also like bigger rodents? So with bigger rodents, no, um, I haven't had too many problems with that. I think it's because I have a cat that I keep outside. So he usually kills all the, the mice. Um, cats are really good if you keep them outside. Um, they actually do a lot for gardens. Um, so no, I haven't had too many problems with the, the rodents per se. Uh, fruit flies, I do have problems if it gets like really hot. You'll see a lot of the fruit flies, but I usually keep a the lid that it comes that the bucket comes with. I usually keep the lid on it until I'm ready to add something else to it. Okay, mm -hmm. and then like I was saying before, let's see, we got another question. How will you know when your compost is ready? So you will know your compost is ready um, if you get it in your hand and it smells very earthy. Um, if it you you um, get it in your hand and you don't see, there we go. <laughs> I was gonna say, Althea was right on, <laughs> right right. on cue. So it looks like, uh, like black dirt. 
So that's when you know it is, is ready to go. Um, and then too, a lot of the things that you put in there, you won't be, you won't be seen. So you won't be seeing a lot of the vegetable scraps you had in there. The leaves that you did put in there will be broken down to smaller sizes. You might have a, a couple of clumps of, of big leaves, but majority of it will be broken down. Um, if you have large, larger twigs, those will still be in there, but it has a really, it's not gonna smell like rot or anything like that. It's gonna smell real earthy. Okay, and then you, I know you were mentioning the other day, you. Um, we're using the ash in yours. A couple, you had a couple questions in the chat box about the ash. Can you talk to oh, that a little bit? So, um, yep. So I, I like to do bonfires. Um, I like to burn a lot of wood. Um, I have a wood burning stove. So what I do is I try to use everything that um, that that I have that I use that is recyclable, and I try to recycle. So I actually put ash in my compost as well. Um, you don't want to put too much in there. Um, it's kind of like. Um, kind of, I would say maybe one five ga gallon bucket, kind of adding on to that three parts brown and then one part green. Um, and then what that does is that's gonna put uh, some more nutrients and lime in there as well. So it's really good for the soil. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, and how, how long does your pile, how long does it take to break down? I, I know it depends on you know, how hot you're getting it and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, it depends on, like, it's, like you said, how hot you're getting it. Um, usually, I'm trying to say I've never really timed it, um, but I would say a couple months, I would think. Um, but it, it really depends, too. Like, are you putting a lot of grass clippings in there? Is a lot of dry? Um, and then sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually go buy worms. And I'll add them to it if I feel that it's, it's not it's not going fast enough. And then I'll ch check on it and wet it down. Um, so, and, and then it also depends on how hot it gets. So in my compost, there's actually a window that's directed at the sun, on the side of the sun. So if we get a lot of hot days, um, it, it'll heat up real good. And it might, it might only take, you know, three months okay. to really break down. Um. I I'm on the screening um, okay. uh, slide. Um, I've actually never done the screening. Oh, okay. Yeah, I um I have. Sometimes you get those larger sticks that don't break down all the way. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is just one one method of screening it. You can use some of that chicken wire. Um, and sift it if you want something finer, particularly if you're using it for, if you're using it right in your garden beds, it's not a huge deal, but if you're using it for um, starting seeds or something like that, you might want more of a finer, you know, compost. So, um, so yeah. Um, and where are you buying your, um, where are you buying your worms? Somebody asked, or are you just buying, buying like worms from like the bait store? Yep. Yeah, yep, just buy them from the bait store. Uh, even Walmart. Uh, Walmart has worms. I try not to go to Walmart a lot, but um, if I'm in the area and they're, they're close, I'll go there and get a couple uh, cartons of worms. Um, also, you can buy them online. Uh, there's a lot of places that sell red wigglers is usually what I get. Um, they produce, and I think the reason, am I correct, red wigglers produce I think they produce somewhere like double, double their, their their weight or something like that, and and compost. They break it down faster than a lot of other worms. Um, not 100% sure on that, but if you look into that, I think they the way they break down the compost is faster than like our regular earthworms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody uses the. I know a couple of folks who um who raise the the regulars, <laughs> and they uh, they sell them. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, how do we use it? That's what we're on this slide about um, how are you how are you using your compost? So what I do is um, uh, I take a compost, the, the bucket, and I work it into the soil that I'm already using. So what you're gonna do is add a one five gallon uh, bucket per four by eight area. Uh, mulch or side dressing, plant uh, midway through the season. And then you want, or you can mix with potting soil when growing transplants. 
okay? So you're gonna fill the pots, um, three to six parts potting soil and one part compost. Or you can make um, what they call composting tea. So what that is, is that is, so the compost would think of it as insect poop. <laughs> Is, is a way to, to really get you to understand. The dirt will be the insect poop. The compost tea will be the insect urine or the, the juice that's left over. So you can use that as like a fertilizer. Um, so a good way to do that is to get two five gallon buckets, okay? Drill a hole in the bottom of that compost bucket, the first one, and then put a screen on it. Um, and then, so all the, the material the compost material is going to be in that first bucket and then when you put that on that second bucket under that one um all that drainage is going to go through that hole and you're going to get your compost tea in there okay and that is really rich in nutrients um it's a really great fertilizer liquid fertilizer and i think if you mm -hmm. look to buy it online like i think it's like 25 dollars a gallon or something like that it's really um expensive so to make your own is actually really good Big Mo Bait, I saw someone said about Red Withers. Okay, go to the next slide. Troubleshooting. Okay, so bad smell, that means you have, you need to add more dry material. So um, you need to add more leaves or, um, Brown paper bags um, is what I do sometimes if it's getting too stinky. Um, sticks, uh, you can do that as well. Um, if there's pests, you want to turn it more often. Um, no heat. So if you go put your hand in there or you don't feel any heat really coming off of it, add water and then you need to also turn it as well. It needs to really be you know moving. You need to get that airflow in there and get that 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 water in there as well, okay? Mm -hmm. um, another thing is if it, you know, a bad smell, just make sure that there is no like um, meat or anything like that. And if there is, if you could kind of take it out, um, but you know, if it's too far in there, just try to turn it and it'll, it'll break down eventually, okay? Okay, so a lot of people have break, questions huh? about the different types of pile. So here we are. So these are open compost piles. So as you can see, like the one on the left, that one looks, um, that's a huge compost pile. I don't know if any of us who are at home uh, can have that in their backyard without the neighbors really complaining. Um, and you see the one right there, they have, look like they had a farm. They have a lot of um, look like pumpkins, tomatoes. Looks like there's even ash in there as well. Uh, the one to the bottom right is looks like very leafy. Um, that's a huge compost pile. Mm -hmm. And I think the one left is looks also like some leaves as well. Is that steam coming off of it? Can't tell. It looks like some steam is coming off of it. Yeah, it will get that hot. But um, yeah. Definitely. Even a wood, even a wood chip pile. It's like a big chemistry thing happening under there and even yeah. a big wood chip pile i've seen it kick off steam like that um so Hannah these... is saying how do you turn them and um if you have a really large pile like this you may want some machinery but your home pile are you just using a um are you just using your your hands to turn it i mean your uh, pitchfork so... sorry the name of that tool was not coming to my brain <laughs> pitchfork Right, so um, for mine, um, I usually use a pitchfork. Um, and like I said, my compost bin actually goes four feet into the ground. So um, it's a little, I would do it a little differently now, um, just because it's kind of hard to get down in there and turn it. So sometimes I have to, ju I, I jump into mine and I, I turn it that way. Um, but yeah, I usually use a pitchfork or a, um, or a shovel to kind of mm -hmm. turn it, just, just get it, going a little bit yeah how I'll often do you like turn it um i usually turn it probably once a week yeah once a week or once every two weeks depending on how busy i am and here are some pallet bins um mm -hmm. as you see they have one side that looks like they have um some, some dry 
material and then they have another side where it's more green material and then it was like to the right at the bottom they have a it's like a, a one system and they have a cover over that one and the thing about pallets is you can find pallets anywhere uh pallets are very accessible um they're all over you go on craigslist uh tons of pallets that people give away um even if you drive down uh i think it's what is that eight mile close to warren there's a lot of uh factories just make sure that the pals weren't you have like any type of oil or anything like that or make sure they're um someone said heat treated yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah there's usually a lot in eastern market too i just picked up some from my backyard um okay. and they're by the you know by the trash bins and stuff that people are throwing them yeah. away um okay so there's the open the open the pallet system which i'll send you a um i'm going to send you a copy of our one pager about um and then and then there's these I'll let you... there's a chicken wire uh bins now i'm not a huge fan of the chicken wire ones and the reason why is because of rodents i feel like they're just very um i mean the other ones are open as well but i, I don't Something about the one, something about the chicken wire ones, I just don't like. <laughs> I tell you, we used to put in our design. We used to put the chicken wire at the bottom of the pallets. Okay. And um, I found that when I went to turn the piles, my pitchfork would always get caught in them. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, th that too. And I don't know. I, I think just aesthetically, just me, it's just not pleasing in my backyard. But some oh. people do. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Ross. <laughs> well, go ahead. Me and Barbara were on the same page about that. Looks impossible to turn. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. So here's some other designs that we've seen out in the community. Yeah. Um. There's different ways you can do it. Um. Now, even with the one at the right, the it's like hay bales. Um. I've seen people do it that way and actually grow inside of the hay. Um, because some of that that compost tea will will seep into the hay, and you can actually grow inside of that. So I've seen that done. Um, but like I said, these ones are I'm not sure how well they will work in the city. Um, if you're in the city, um, these are more I think um, places with a lot more a lot more land. Let me Oops. turn to the next one. This one is really cool. If you don't know about this method, have you done this before, um, Ross? I have, not, I have not done this method before. Yeah. But I think it's a really cool method. Yeah, this is the, the lasagna beds. It's particularly yeah. in the fall. Um, I've made, I've built these where you're, you're basically, you're making a small compost pile. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you're layering it like a lasagna with your greens and browns. Um, you let that sit over the winter and it's ready in the summer to plant. I mean, it's ready the next spring to plant. You um, to it, right? Yeah. Now you don't want to put seeds in there because it's still not broken down enough for seeds, but um, you can definitely put some transplants in there by the next spring. It's usually broken down, especially if you layer it really good and it's getting some good sun. It's basically you just built a compost pile right there. A um, okay. couple of questions I miss here. Um, yep. Yep. So, so the, okay, here's some of those systems. Yeah, people were asking about. Yeah, so um, I actually, I remember my grandmother actually had the one to the top left. Um, and we had that compost bin, and we did not like it at all because it was extremely hard to turn. Okay. Um, <laughs> something about, I, you know, getting in there and turning it, it was just, it was a, it was a pain. Mm -hmm. So, not a fan of that one. Um, you have these other ones, these little like tumbler ones, uh, like the one at the bottom. I think you can, I think the whole thing turns. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are good. I think they, I'm not sure how much they run, uh, but these are ones that if you don't feel like building one and you just want something simple, uh, you probably can buy these online or maybe Keeper on Detroit has uh, resources for this one as well. You know, I did see Ross, I was going to maybe try it one year, but I saw this guy on YouTube and he had like, 
he made a couple of tumblers out of some five gallon buckets. Um, okay. So he could tumble it, um, you know, by itself. So basically he held the sticks up and then had the five gallon buckets this way and, and did that. So um, something to try. Uh, Magda uh, says they're um, the single tumbler is 50 bucks online. Oh, 40 bucks at Aldi's. Aldi's is that deal. Yes, it um, is. <laughs> um, okay. I just saw oh. a question. I think, oh, the, oh, that was the last slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, great. We had um, a couple of questions, and then you said a couple of people were interested um, in seeing. Let me stop this. Okay. Someone a couple of people were interested in seeing the. Um, your setup said so you might okay. let us get a sneak peek. <laughs> sure. Um, I'll, I'll go through these comments and make sure we didn't miss do. Um, I do the five gallon buckets like Ross with, uh, would these have any different results? You, you composting right in the five gallon buckets, Barbara, I'm not sure if that's what you were saying. No. Yeah. Um, Okay, yes, that's a good technique, Angela. Thank you for that. Yep. The compost needs that sunlight to heat up. Um, so you want, you definitely want to get sunlight. Um, sunlight is really good. Um, so the more sunlight, the better. It's not going to hurt it if it gets too much sunlight. It's only just going to make it heat up faster and, and break down faster. Yeah. Um, something, say, something about um, for an elder, what type of tumbler or compost bin would you suggest? You see that question popped away. Hold on one second. No, I didn't see the question. Sorry, I'm kind of trying to type um, for an elder. I think those tumblers are nice for the elders because um, they you're basically cranking it or cranking it like this, and you don't have to get in there and do a lot of do a lot of shuffling. Um, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna while you read the questions, I'm gonna sh show you my compost setup. If I can figure out how to flip the camera. <laughs> okay, so this is actually some of the ash that I had from a bonfire I've been burning. Actually, I've been doing a bonfire for about <laughs> three weeks straight. And here is my compost bin right here. Okay, Ross, I didn't get an invite to the, the bonfire. You didn't? Six feet. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I will wear the mask. <laughs> okay. I got you on the next one. And as you see at the top, I don't know if you guys can see it, that is the where the sunlight goes in. Uh, so it's completely enclosed. And then I have two, I don't know if you guys can see that, I have two doors. Uh, this is the one I use to drop my scraps in. And this is the one where I use to pull out the soil. So if you can see in there, I got some greens in there. Um, I got some brown stuff in there. If you dig down deeper, um, it has a lot more of uh, food scraps. Um, I got a couple eggshells in there. Um, and then here is that five gallon bucket I was talking about. This is the holes I use for aeration. And then this is what I've got some old mangoes that we didn't eat. The kids wanted them, but decided not to eat them. Uh, some avocados that they wanted, but decided not to eat those too. <laughs> and then to um, the eggshells like this, I wouldn't put it in there as whole. I'll just break this on down. So then after I do that, I'll just dump that in there. And then if like looking at it looks a little too dry. So I actually just spray it down. And then let it do its, its thing. Mm -hmm. uh, folks really like your system there. Well. 
there's another so i got two two windows that's going to heat it up from both sides so once this thing gets like on a sunny sunny day when i have enough water in there this thing really heats up and as you can see it just looks kind of like a dog house so whenever somebody comes back here they're like you got a dog I'm like no nah, that's just it's my compost bin that's my compost <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's that's really dope uh, a lot of people are saying that's really nice uh, did you build that or do you have I the did plans that, yes. for that um i have them sketched out on a piece of paper <laughs> <laughs> okay well maybe uh maybe we can work together on getting that out to folks some plans for the that or even if it's just a sketching um a couple yeah, questions here that came up while you were doing that um do you recommend like shredding things before you're composting? A couple of people had asked that. Um, for me, it seems like a lot, but have you shredded things before you put them in the system? Um, Shred things like what exactly? Like food scraps, like blended them before you do it, or um, even if you have like um, uh, leaves, would you would you uh, maybe run our lawnmower for it? Or um, I think somebody, I, mean, I think Catherine had a chipper, like maybe she should chip them beforehand you totally you can it's not gonna hurt it it's just about the time that you have and how much time you want to put into it i honestly don't have the time to do it um or like i, I just don't have the time to do it yeah um, it's still gonna break down regardless it just may take a longer if it's if it's bigger or in like whole pieces but it's, it's definitely still gonna break down no matter what as long as you have like we said that that air the, the microbes and that water in there, it's it's gonna break down. Um, some of the like paper bags, if I put like a paper bag or like a, a cardboard in there or something like that, I'll try to, usually I'll try to break that down a little bit or kind of rip it up. Um, but when my kids put it in there, they don't like to <laughs> rip it up. That's why we got big chunks in there. But um, usually I try to, or like twigs, I'll try to break the twigs down a little bit smaller. Um, but usually I just try to put stuff in there and just keep it moist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then um, question on, have you, well, um, does it have to be on grass? Could it be on a, could it, Could someone do it on a concrete pad? Do you have any opinion on that? On like, a concrete pad? Like if you didn't have uh, grass in your backyard or if you didn't have the room on your grass, could you do it like on your driveway or something like that? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and then I don't know if you've experienced that someone, I think it was John a little bit earlier had asked a question about, um, was it, I'm sorry, that was a little bit farther up, but John, if you want to pop it in there again, there was a question about white, a white substance on there. Was that mold maybe, or have you ever had that experience of, of some, a white substance growing on your finished compost? On my finished compost? Um, not on my finished compost. I have not. I feel like that I have seen it on um, compost that wasn't, like I didn't have enough dry material in there. So like in my little food scrap bucket, I felt like I would get white mold on there. Um, so oh, I'm not sure. yeah, he said it wasn't the finished product. Sorry, it was the white substance near the heat, near the center of the pile where it was getting heated up. Yeah, I've never had, like I said, I had it more on the food scrap. So probably what I would do is add more dry material. It might be molding, mm -hmm. um, might be a little too wet. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like, uh, you know, a lot of people are jumping in, it sounds like it could be some kind of fungus or uh, mushrooms or mildew. Um, yeah. So um, adding more dry ingredients. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, Dajana was asking, um, she said she had a pile and it was attracting raccoons. Um, she's saying, and I think in the presentation you said turning it um, helps with the pests. Was that right? Yep, turning it helps yep. with the pests. Yep. Moving it around. Um, yep. Okay, well, we've been on here for about an hour of your time today. Um, if there's any final questions about compost, um, feel free to throw them in there before we jump off. Um, also, I wanted to, um, Hannah said, this was great, Ross. Thanks. Thank uh, you guys for, uh, for coming, joining us. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, if you have any final questions, go ahead and throw it in there. Um, and then um, if there were any uh, larger questions about Key Growing Detroit, gardening resources, any issues that you want to discuss, I'll stick around for a minute if folks have questions about that. But hopefully uh, you have uh, already, if you're a garden resource program member, hopefully you've signed up for your hot crop pickup that's um, starting next week. And we have slots for, I think, two weeks um, open hoping that um, we're planning to get through about 1800 gardens. So um, be patient with us and make sure you sign up for a slot. Um, yeah, doing a 1800 gardens, man. That's, I mean, that's what we're planning for because we're really seeing an uptick, you know, thankfully in people growing their own food, which is, which is one of the, one of the upsides. Um, did he use cinder blocks in your compost holder? Did, Did I use blocks in uh, my compost? Center blocks or cinder blocks? Center blocks in the compost. So mine is, like I said, mine is dug down um, about four feet into the ground, and then there are on the on the sides inside of it, there are cinder blocks walls in mm -hmm. the ground. Yep. But then once you go down further, there's not like a cinder block base. Um, it's just soil at the bottom. And then question about um, using uh, organic produce versus conventional produce in a pile. Um, I think I would think that's preference, you know. Um, but they'll they all break down. <laughs> they all gonna break down. Um, then so those things that get moldy, would you recommend um, removing the mold or just going ahead and adding the dry the dry ingredients and. Um letting the mold get all mixed in there. I think just adding the dry ingredients in there, I think that'd be fine. I don't think that's, yeah. that's that bad. And then plus it too, it's, it's white mold, which I, what I was told that white mold's okay when it's in, in the garden kind of sense. Um, and I saw someone ask me who built mine. I actually built mine myself. And I had help from my kids. Okay. <laughs> um, if you, uh, some, somebody said they hadn't gotten the Eventbrite link to sign up for Hot Crops. Um, that is, uh, if you haven't gotten that, go ahead and send us an email to info at keepgroundetroit.org and we'll get that over to you, Angela. Um, uh, if there's any additional questions, we're going to send an email I'll uh, include Ross's, uh, I'll CC Ross. So um, I'll send an email with the slides, a recording, the compost bin, the pallet system, um, mm -hmm. one pager that we have. Um, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to get Ross to give me a sketch of his uh, doghouse design for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, we'll send something raw um, and we'll send that in your email. And so you can ask additional questions uh Dajanabi, yeah he said he built his himself so uh, yep. um can I'm we have chicken designs out to you guys do you want to answer this Ross? i can do, can What's we that? have chickens in the city you i see you got a big old chicken coop back there Are uh, you... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well uh yeah, we chickens have. are technically the... still illegal okay. in the city technically no we cannot have chickens in the city um, but I feel the city has enough to worry about. I feel the government has enough to worry about than me growing chickens in my backyard. Yeah. And they are enclosed. They are in a garage. My neighbors can't see them unless I open up my garage. Yeah. So. We, uh, I mean, I we definitely have heard of people getting tickets uh, for them. You know, I would say uh, usually. Um, I was gonna. Usually, that's a neighbor complaining or something yeah. like that. And there's also, I've been doing some research, look into the Right to Farm Act, because we all have, uh, under the Constitution, Michigan Constitution, we have a right to farm. So from what I was told is, from what I read, is if you have a small scale farm and then you do, um, you sell produce, whether that's a couple of eggs or a couple of tomatoes, then you're a farmer. So mm -hmm. that, that may be covered under the Right to Farm Act. And that will supersede city ordinance. But look okay. into that. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, we got a couple of 
friends working on that for sure um, at the city. Uh, it says, um, what exactly is Keep Growing Detroit doing with the 1800 Gardeners? That's, that's a good question, Tom. If you're new to Keep Growing Detroit and new to our programming, uh, mm -hmm. we have a program called the Garden Resource Program. People sign up every year to receive uh, vegetable starts and seeds and access to resources like tool sharing and compost, uh, finished compost and um, classes like this. Um, and so those 1800 people are people that are signed up for the program. Last year, we last year, just in, in context, we ended up with 1600 gardens. Uh, we're seeing an uptick already in the number of gardens. And so that's that's uh, that's what I was talking about. Uh, a lot of folks saying great information. Um, great information, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it says, don't ask, don't tell about the chickens. Hey, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm going through the chat box. I think I've gotten to everything. If you're still on the line and you have questions, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes. Um, if not, uh, we'll be signing off so you can en enjoy the rest of your day. We're so glad that you joined us. Um, and thank you, Ross, for Thank you, Ross, for um, for hosting our class and holding us down in the compost arena. I really like your setup. Yeah, and thanks, T. Thanks for the invite. Uh, thank you guys for for growing, really, and thanks for being interested in it. Uh, I think this is like really important to take control of our own food system, um, especially with everything that's going on. So, thank you, guys. Absolutely. All right, well, um, if I don't see any further questions, I'll go ahead and log off. You guys have a good day, okay? See you later, Ross. All right, peace. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Peace.